Heavenly Father, as we gather to hear your word this morning, I pray that you will open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to receive. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. There are a couple of words, one sentence, in our gospel lesson that needs to ring true in each and every one of our hearts that claim to know and be followers of Jesus Christ. Let me repeat this. This is words that just stand right out. Peter took him aside and rebuked Jesus. See, Jesus was explaining to his disciples the things that need to happen, the things that are destined to occur. The plan of man's salvation had been ordained since before the foundation of time itself. And Peter, God forbid, you can't do that. I don't want to see you do that. You can't do that. Notice how Jesus replied. He didn't say, oh, Peter, don't worry. It'll be all right. He didn't say that. He goes, get behind me, Satan. Go away. St. Paul writes in another part of Scripture, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. And here is a clear example in the gospel today. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, and then tells Peter, you are a stumbling block to me, for you're setting your mind not on divine or the things of God, but you're using just the mind of man. You can't do that. There lies your problem. The book of Romans that had our epistle today is a very interesting book. It has 16 chapters. And if you divide the book of Romans up, it starts out in the beginning just laying out a case of just how bad off we are as individuals. He spends chapter after chapter, verse after verse, outlining what is wrong with the condition of men. You know, truce breakers, backbiters, evil in their heart, immoral, uh, gossipers, whatever the case may be. These are the things that defile you and make you filthy before an almighty God. And yet you have the gall to try to justify yourself as, notice in the epistle today, do not repay evil with evil, for vengeance is mine, does saith the Lord. One of the hardest things for a human being to do, and I'm one of them, I'm a, I'm a people just like you. How many times have you been on a highway and got cut off by a car? How Christian do we act at that split second? We don't. It's not in our human nature. We're ready to run this guy off the road and watch him crash into a tree and burn the car up. That'll make us happy for a split second. That's our human nature. It's hard to overcome that and say, Lord, take this away from me and you deal with that pickup truck. I can't. Because once we do... Once we seek revenge, then we've crossed a line. Once we're angry about something and we speak badly of people, we have crossed a line. Stumbling block. Peter became a stumbling block to his own Lord Jesus Christ because he is so busy thinking in the mind of man that he cannot see the divine, and the plan being laid out before his very eyes. And Jesus has to be exasperated, being confined into the humanness and the condition of men for those years on the face of this earth. 
The question was posed to me before the church service. How many years did it take to get the disciples up to speed? You know, I don't think they ever got up to speed until the Holy Spirit came and descended upon the church in Jerusalem. That was a very interesting question because all through the earthly ministry, all the way up to Gethsemane, they're still messing up terribly. Peter, the one who Jesus said, upon this rock I shall build my church, had to be the most porous, worthless rock of them all. He denied Jesus, what, three times? Try to cut off somebody's ear? Rebukes Jesus when he talks about the cross? God takes the folly of men. Think about that for a second. God seldom calls the qualified. He qualifies the called. And Peter's the perfect example. He's the last person in my way of thinking when I worked in human and, you know, secular endeavors. He's the last guy I'm going to hire to manage anything. He's a hothead. He's going to get me sued. I'm going to lose business with a guy like him. But God confounds the wisdom of mankind each and every day. You know, these lessons draw us to an understanding today, and I think this is the takeaway point that I want you to have. We believe ourselves to be wise. There are times we try to understand the mind of God, and we think we've got it figured out. Oh, I understand it now. If you ever, anybody ever that says that, I'm going to tell you a little, my wife will understand this one. Some of the work that I did before coming here in the broadcast world was for a large shortwave broadcaster that reaches around the globe, if anybody's familiar with shortwave. And this station was founded by a Christian ministry. And they were doing very well for many, 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 many decades until the one day he decided he had the mind of God and knew what day Jesus was coming again. It was going to be May 22nd, 2012. His ministry failed. A station was bought by somebody else, and that's how I got in there to do some work. Don't ever be so arrogant to think you understand the mind of God. Don't ever think you need to tell God how to run his church how to deal with his people, how to do any of it. You're getting into a place you don't belong when you do that. And you're liable to hear in the back of your mind, you're a stumbling block. Get to behind me, Satan. I was pleasantly surprised last week at this church's annual meeting. I felt a spirit here that probably hasn't been here in a while. And I realize that God is beginning to move in this place and in, in his people, turning hearts and minds around. A community like Sky Valley has its wonders, its beauties, and it also has its troubles when it's a small town. I know, I, we bought property here. We are going to be living here all the time when the thing gets finished. We're learning about mountain time <laughs> when it comes to plumbers. <laughs> but you understand that in a small community, and, and I should know this because I was raised in a large metropolitan area as a very young child, then we moved to a smaller community, and it, everybody knows everything about everybody, and they, they take care of everybody's business but their own. Learned that in small towns like Tacoa back in the 70s. I was a news director there, and you ought to see the phone call. You wouldn't believe what I saw so-and-so doing. Why are you telling the newsman of the radio station this? You want me to do a story about it? <laughs> I think they really wanted me to. It's easy to fall into that trap of trying to be the judge and the jury, the executioner when it comes to what you see the faults of others to be. It's real easy. And even there, Jesus would say, you're a stumbling block. Get behind me. Get behind me, Satan. I don't need this. We fall into that trap. You know, we try to weigh the sins of others out and ignore our own. 
What did Jesus say in that parable? Before you take the speck out of your brother's eye, you better get that big log out of your own. Today's lesson, the takeaway point. If we try to think about everything and confine them strictly to human terms, then we miss the greatest blessings that God has to give his people and his church today. If we think in strictly human terms, the enemy of our soul can, you know, use our mind against our own self-interest, and we don't even see it. What is the greatest way to win a war? I'm going to close on this thought because we're short of time today with communion. Divide and conquer. A house divided up against itself can't stand. Any general in warfare will tell you if you can break their lines of communication and you can divide them. Because even breaking communication lines, they are now divided. There's no commonality. They can't respond in a uniform way. And you can pick them off. That's how warfare works. You don't necessarily have to have overwhelming numbers if you can divide your enemy. Satan will always work to divide his people and his church and try to get them off the things of God and worry about the temporal things of man. Divided and man-centered the church. The church never, never succeeds. The church is the living body of Christ, a divine institution on this earth. We will celebrate together communion where with the saints before, the saints yet to come, and the saints of today, we gather in his presence to partake for a moment of the divine. And it can change our very nature. Heavenly Father, I pray for this church today as we, as we continue to proclaim your name. May people's hearts be changed. May families be stitched back together. May our needs be met. May our hearts be open to receive the good things you've promised to your children. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.